eroding from a corrosion disguise and from inside the heart. You couldn't see the road and you really felt that the sea was below it was part of the property. Now this house set down here the service quarters are a number of characters. The house had many levels inside, many different kinds of windows. So although you were looking at the same view, you thought the view were different. And one would see a ship going past, and you'd see a part of the ship and the entire ship. And then you'd see the ship again to a slip. And the house had in the back garden, which is really the front garden, the swimming bath, which you see over there. Right. I have a few slides of this house. Here another flat on view. Um, a view of the corner, of the balcony in the corner that protected the main bathroom, the bathroom for the street. The entrance to the house, the house splitting parts to allow light into the upstairs. Here another screen terrace with the more back bedroom. Going up the steps to the first floor and you could walk from upstairs down these terraces on the swimming bath and the terrace directly opposite the dining room onto the courtyard. So the house was designed in such a way that it formed one kind of central uh, patio which was protected from the neighbors and could not be overlooked where the people who owned the house, the charms could entertain and look at Sunday without feeling exposed to their neighbors. These uh, louvers which you see over there are protections to conceal their conditioners. The light fitting were an integral, integral part of the design of the house. Some more views of the steps leading into the dining room terrace and the balcony above, and a view more remote looking back at the terraces over the outbuildings of the house, which got lower and lower so that it didn't need a building. The house had very many bits of buildings as if they were ruins where the house could not carry on. Sometimes the valley terrace would run up to the extra bits of structure and whatnot. And the swimming bath was even very much in the shape of one of the rooms of the house. It was just a negative of that particular room. Another house for our need of evolve here in a kinematic pocket with convex form of roof and a view from the street looking at the carport and at the main entrance and this very strong part of the court. If you look at it carefully at the photographs, you will see that the house is in very many of its areas placed in stone with two textures of stone. The chimneys and the fat that is worn are in one kind of stone and the pillars are all placed in, a, in the same stone, but the stone is broken down to its more mosaic. So there was a great differentiation in the texture of the material that the house was placed in. Here another axiomatic of the various terraces, again overlooking the street and blind from the street, and a view of the other facade and all the water from the main wall, almost all the water from the main roof of the house concentrated onto the spot and was brought down in the pillar. Another house, a house which was, had a very strong duality. Some people thought it was two houses, the third enough with one central cement of the fourth and a lateral view of the same house. In most of these houses you see that they have solar ethos up on the roof and 
Scarlet Eagles was something that we got onto many years ago, and I first started buying them, and then we pirated them at various missions, and we had Scarlet Eagles in most <coughs> of the missions that I dealt with, which you will see later. Another one of the palaces, the axonometric of the past and the very steep, the very tall and the very small, the very fragments of the past heavening and the very different kinds of different structures and had it offered us at the time that it was in heaven. And two more details as you can from across the street at, at the later stage when the Pergola and the Tsunami and the part of the Central was part of our element. A view looking back at the chimney from the fireplace and one could just see one of the light fittings in this place that were made wood. It's a pair of semis, but instead of being done in the usual manner, there were two streets and later a third street, and the semis are just back to back. And previous to that, I had designed Whitpetty and Hotel on Mozambique Island on a very, very small site. And here is an axonometric of this hotel. It was going to be built out of coral stone. We were going to make the windows in the traditional way that windows are still made in the north without, without um, machines or a proper workshop. And uh, I was very, very sad when the hotel did not get built. Later, I had these two doctors and <coughs> designed this house for them. This house had a very rich series, or each of these houses had a very rich series of um, interior spaces with a double volume living room and uh, three quarters of the volume study behind it. It was built without this pergola, which somehow is an advantage. And upstairs had two very large studios for the ladies of the house. They were both artistic ladies and they wanted studios. Now, and here it is. The red house, as it was in, in its early days in Lorenzo Marx, with these, with these candle-like chimneys and a detail of <coughs> Teddy, can you try and focus this one for the bird? No luck. Okay. Now you will see what happened to the to the red house. Go on. More. The red house turned white with fright. <laughs> Here it is. It has become the embassy of the Northern Korean. <laughs> Public. <laughs> it's, 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 it's quite an amazing sight that this should happen to a house. You know, it happens to people, but not to houses. <laughs> and here it is, the screens have turned green. Strange that it has become much more Portuguese than it ever was, but because it is traditional in Portugal to paint the screens in deep green, in dark green. I didn't take this photograph. It was a friend of mine who took it and sent it to me. He was sure that I would be very interested to see it. You will see that it turns white three times. Come on, Hedy. Outside the range of <laughs> okay, do it again. Another one. These were very 
deeply recessed windows, there was a little balcony of about two foot or two foot six, and where there was no balconies, there were, there were cupboards and niches and recesses for lights and all sorts of things. Up on the roof there was a little drying yard, again the two solar eaters, okay. Here the building for the savings bank of the orphans and widows of the police. <laughs> it was a cooperative building. It had um, um, a cooperative store at ground floor level, storage at basement level. It had two floors of factories and two apartments per floor for various policemen to live in. And the wives of these policemen worked in the factories which they run themselves as a cooperative making shoes, making clothes, which they then sold and made money for their savings bank, their investment bank. And here a view of the back which was really the front because one entered from this and the goods lift which uh, served the two floors of factory. There was a floor of offices as a mezzanine to the store and the little apartments all the way up. It was a very, very cheap building. The floors were cement floors. It was a very, it cost very, very little money to build even by comparison to the price of other buildings in Lorenzo Marx. It had these precast elements into balconies because it faced onto the west. It overlooked the cemetery, the old cemetery in Lorenzo Marx. And here we have a bit of the facade with a lady watching what's going on down in the street. It's the central balcony. Here to another slice these are both two slices of many slices of street face that I've designed and that I've built. Another little slice first as a drawn isolated slice uh, as a building for Aya. It was done for some clients who had this tiny slice of the property in downtown Lorenzo Marx, about seven meters frontage or so. And I designed the building for them, again with a vertical sunscreen and warehouses at the back. And when it was finished, we hired it. We hired it to a shipping company that was looking desperately for, for office space. And it was a beautifully built building and quite expensive, <clears throat> quite different from the previous building. It had a sunscreen in marble which was hung on brass pieces. It was faced in, it is faced in ceramic mosaic. It's, it had these strange sculptural elements which contain the facade. One went into it and there was a staircase in the middle with this big skylight and the inside of that staircase was all faced in the same mosaic as the outside. The little holes are for air conditioning units and there is a view of the back of this building and the skylights <coughs> which light up the warehouses at the back which very soon after the building was completed were turned into offices and a mezzanine was built inside the warehouse. It was something that we had not envisaged at all and here a detail <coughs> of the facade, the front facade of the building with an air conditioner that someone decided wouldn't do well down here and it got plonked inside the window space. Okay. Now I think this is the last story in this carousel. These are a few shots of another style, the American Egyptian style 
which was very popular some years ago. This is the Abrigo dos Pequeninos, the Nossa Senhora de Conceição at Carreira de Tiro in Summer Shield. And here it is, this linear building with all these pyramidal elements, the toy houses and the chapel for the sisters, the big water tank. And on the other side, there were going to be three pyramids, just like this one and a few more, but we never got round to that. The sisters never managed to raise the money again. Uh, here, the pyramid for the bus that fetched the children before the road was made. The road was later made. And the Yes House, which was um, an office building and a caretaker's house for a factory complex, for a soap factory that I did a lot of work for in the Rennes de Mars. This is a photograph of the Yes House in its heyday. It, very soon after it was built, the factory was sold, the offices were no longer needed, and for many years it was run as one, two, three, four factories, little factories, and the house became an office, and later it also became a factory. Here an excellent, uh, an isometric drawing of, of the Yes House. And the Yes House is called Yes because of this chimney which says Sin, and that is Yes in Portuguese, and um, the, those were the initials of the firm, Spence Industrial de Mozambique. I also designed the symbol for them, and then I transformed that symbol into, into a mural, and that was the symbol that they imposed on all their products for quite some time. Okay. Two more views of the Yes House, a lateral view of the staircase and the cloak rooms with a little tank over, raised to give pressure, and a drawing of the main elevation with me explaining something to the client. Another of these buildings, this one a little service station at the border of Mozambique, which was soon after much, much altered and much damaged. These were the pyramids which ro roofed over the workshop space. And here Betty, about 12 years old, looking into the inside of the motor car. Okay. Um, this is almost part of the same story, <clears throat> although this is a kind of sub-story, and it's called an exhumation of Andre Palladio as performed in Johannesburg between the years of 1964 or 65 and 1968. Now, this was a house broken up into many houses. Originally, it was broken up into four little houses. Then it grew another house here into five little houses. And this is a later version of alterations and additions to this house, which hasn't yet been realized. There's still these two elements to be built. They almost got built some two years ago, and then the people decided not to. Now, this is a very fragmented kind of a house with the main house, motor car house, what starts off as the outbuildings and then becomes another playroom. This becomes the art buildings with a sun, a raised sun platform, a swimming bath, a house for people to sit out, or maybe for a band to play at a party, at a reception, because this was very much of a night house. The whole house contains a series of elements which are concealed within the structure of the house. The whole house lights up. Here, the, the Desirella house, just about at the time that it was being finished, there the grass is quite green. Here they haven't even put 
Madras Inn. We are looking from the west side at the pergola and the lounge in the room. Now this is edge to edge Napoleon marble downstairs with electrical eating underneath. It's a very sumptuously finished house. The windows, I told the owners, I wanted to have made in Lorenzo Marx. They were made in Lorenzo Marx, elaborately like cupboards. They were loaded onto trucks and driven up to Joburg to be installed. Everything has been very carefully detailed. Here you can see one of the precast concrete light boxes which run right through the house. Next. A view from the bottom end, from the service quarters end. Again, the light fittings, especially cast hair bricks, which were regulation in South Africa, but not in Mozambique. The skylight, which lit the interior space, and the interior space was this um, internal pyramid, which one perceived when one got upstairs. Next bit looking through the courtyard at the car porch and looking <coughs> at the bandstand and you begin to perceive some of the light fittings in the around the swimming bath next and the house as the sun goes down with these personages which guard the swimming bath and the detail of the beginnings of details of these personages which lit the swimming bath. I saw the owners recently and the idea is to now make the water in the swimming bath hot in winter so they can swim in it and it will be quite wonderful because there will be a constant cloud of steam around the swimming bath during the winter months. Next, Perry. And a uh, late afternoon view and the night view of these fittings and a reflection of the fittings in the swimming bath water. Okay? Now, another building in the pyramidal style, but this time a very economical building. It's a clandestine nursery school in the African quarters of Lorenzo Marx, which we tried building several times. The municipal police were after us, and then they just gave up and allowed us to build. It was for a, a group of good, well-intentioned ladies who wanted to build a nursery school but couldn't build it as a building of permanent materials, and I designed this building out of the traditional materials and also as a demonstration that buildings need not cost money that all you need to have if you need buildings is the will to have buildings you can go out and cut the grass and cut the sticks and maybe borrow or steal some cement if you need windows and doors there's usually some demolition going on and you take those on and this is how this building was built and here it is in use at one, this is at a very early stage of its construction when we just put the legs up into holes on the ground, cast the floor slabs and built the thatch, the grass roofs. And this was a market that the woman started quite near the school and a lot of these women kept their children at the school. The other thing we tried at this school was to grow vegetables at the school and we made a deal with, the, with one of the orphanages that, um, <clears throat> that their children would come, their much older children would come to us during the holidays and we'd give them some kind of agricultural instruction and they would work on this, on this green patch and we got the green patch going and it was very, very productive and they'd stay for lunch and eat what we were producing in the green patch, made very good vegetable soup. 
here a view of the children all lined up under the pergola to go into one of the classes, the kitchen in the background, and another story, a separate story, a story of a school I did in Swaziland, Waterfoot School, to which my three eldest children have been. It was a school that I was very much a part of. It was a multiracial school, a school for the Chinese, the black, the Indian, the redskins, and the pinks. Um, it's a painting called Five Profiles and Five Smiles, and somehow <clears throat> I feel it's very much part of the idea of Waterford. And here a drawing that Petty did quite recently for AD of how the school was built. Here the first part of the school built in 63, 64, and it's like a calendar of activities. Then the school spreads and grows all over this hillside. Here, um, an axonometric of the early part of the school and the school as built seen from the hillside we're starting to build some classrooms along that end. <clears throat> another side facade of Waterford and another drawing of Petty of the building of Waterford. We never had a builder, we built it with people that we employed, people were put on the staff of the school. The students helped with quite a lot of the work, casting, painting, carrying stuff around and keeping it clean. And the school was really a very a giant staircase because all the levels were, all the elements were stepped. Here Petty has drawn a dormitory and what a dormitory, a junior dormitory was like. The senior dormitories were much more enclosed and the idea was that each student could decorate his space as, as his own little house. And this they did very wonderfully. Here an early view of the completed junior dormitories and another view looking down onto the valley. Next page and a view of the laboratories for which we were given a grant to build and managed to build very nicely. The whole school was built out of donations, out of gifts, out of the work of the friends. Often we were almost near bankrupt. We could hardly carry on, but the chap who ran the school, Michael Stern, was quite wonderful and he just had to pray a little harder and the money came from somewhere. <coughs> okay. Now, you are looking down one of the dormitory passages, all the screen walls down the dormitory and you are looking at a weekend mural, a mural that I came to paint one weekend, it's a mural of a football game and the idea was to get murals started and get everybody to paint murals all over the school. This only went as far as one other mural and then it died down. Now, I am trying to resuscitate that at the university where I am at now. I've already got some money for paint from the Vice Chancellor and I hope to start painting many new murals at Phipps and get everybody involved. This particular mural of a football was based on a number of paintings I did of footballs which were derived from the scribbles of children on the walls of the houses in the Caniso in Lorenzo Marx. Next. Right, that is the end of the first two carousels. What shall I do? Have an interval or shall we just carry on? Carry on. Okay. fairly small boat 
in Acacia, right at the left of the text, to three concrete men of war and a painting of a caravel, some more men of war, a black one and a white one, the, um, a doll ship and a ship out of blue gum, two ships in a meeting, and the black one, and two she boats at the beach in Lorenzo Marks. Two paintings of ships, one on the left discovering islands, Shiva's sheep running into a painting. Okay. An island of towers. A cargo of soft pyramids. A well guarded foretold ship. Two very aggressive ships with masts and spikes. A boat with a load of pyramids and some lots of trouble on board on the left. <laughs> some pylons. These are very tall pylons, they're about five or six meters high, and a castle uh, which has a lot to do <clears throat> with the habitable woman. Some more pylons and a close-up of the two previous ones. A pillar in bloom A mechanical flower, which is also a house. And the pillar of smiles, there was another one called the Tower of Fat Hearts. They were for a playground for the pyramidal kindergarten. They never got built. A wall and some sort of a monument, or a maquette for a monument. One of them got built in concrete at Byra some years ago. A building and a detail of a building made out of a doorstep. A face, a broken face which can be put together again and again. A temple demonstrating itself, turning over on its back so you can see its plan, an archaic temple, a later temple with skylights, with quite a number of skylights, and when it's turned upside down it becomes a ship. Temple C at Navala. Now there's two, Temple G and H, at Navala as well at Carrera de Tero, a detail of the roofs, um, quite a decadent later temple. <laughs> a temple for a dark Venus, a soft erotic temple, A game, which is also a table, a table that becomes a pavilion with skylights once the spikes are taken off. <laughs> a detail of the spikes. Uh, a pillar turning into a woman. 
the oracle and parts of two girls and a close-up of Our Lady of Revolvers. <laughs> a train, both going up and going sideways. <laughs> the three trains, as they wear at home in Lorenzo Marx, Magritte's time transfixed three times over and a group of nine or eight, nine Iberian slab idols which have been quite fattened. Some idols from the eastern Mediterranean in part via Turnbull Some more dolls and three very amused ones on the left. <laughs> now, this is the hotel on the island of Nossi Bay. This was an hotel that I was asked to do for an hotel company, a Malagasy company and a South African company. <clears throat> and I went out to this island and found this promontory which stuck out into a bay and this is the first design I did and this was the design we actually started building. Now this hotel was really a retaining wall of a hillside and when you arrived all you saw was these two buildings and the rest of these low buildings and one came into an open courtyard because all the circulation was buried underground through ramps. There was a casino contained in this part. The casino was quite a different kind of a building. It was a very rotund, circular element sort of a building. And one went down into grottos on either side. Down at the bottom there was a machine room which was designed like a chapel for all the machines which kept the place cool and hot and all that. Um, there was going to be some sculptures on the beach, some enormous ships on the beach, which would be, there was a very high tide at Norsi Bay, so these ships would be shipwrecked twice a day. Pity. Here they are. This would have been the thing that I had in mind to build these ships out of concrete, these she boats out of concrete, and they would have been covered, just covered by the waters at high tide, and then as the tide went off, they would have went down, they would be revealed on the beach. The painting on the left is called The Power of His Gaze. The <laughs> it's a political painting. The painting on the right, Petty says it's called Easter Rising. <laughs> Here are some of the fragmented <clears throat> groups of buildings, courtyards and row houses that I did for a cooperative in Lorenzo Marx about 20 five years ago. They were usually finished with some murals at the end, murals in stone. This is one of the early murals, a very discreet one, and the houses are fragmented and set back from each other. They've got tiny little garden courts, terraces. There's this communal entrance for people to drive their cars in and for the children to play. Here is another one, which is part of a row a row house group, next, and the biggest one of these terraces, the Miguel Bombarda Terrace, with this fairly narrow uh, central space with houses running down the side. This was to build <coughs> houses instead of apartments, 
And this is looking back up the hillside at the mural, which we did at the end with the workmen on the site, and two views of this mural in various textures of stone, uh, reddish stone, black stone, white stone, and gray foundation stone. And just by moving the surfaces back and forth, it made a very rich, a very wonderful texture. Here the five caterpillars at Stivel. It's um, a country villa for 60 farm workers, farm laborers. And um, it was just roofed of, oh, by the self-supporting corrugated asbestos sheets. And this is when I last saw it before I left Mozambique. It was nearly ready. And I don't know what's happened to it. Here, a lateral view, and a view looking down the main connecting spine with these caterpillars sticking on either side of the spine. This is the entrance onto the dining room and lounge with a kitchen stuck on on the side. <coughs> Here, some mission buildings, a little school that I want to tell you a story about. These are all buildings built, designed with, and built by the Swiss Mission and myself, the Presbyterian Mission in Mozambique, a mission which was constantly in trouble with Mr. Salazar's government, constantly in trouble with Mr. Caetano's government, and constantly in trouble with Mr. Michel's government. So it must be a very good mission. Um, here is school we built ourselves. At this time, I was having a very Luddite period, and I talked the missionaries in not having any machines. Everything had to be done by hand so that the men would stay with their families for as long as possible instead of bringing in builders from the outside. We cleared the fields out of stone, we fetched the sand from the river, we chopped up a couple of trees, which another mission then made the windows out of, and we built this school for very little money. And we even had money to make a fairly big cistern for when the river runs dry. Um, we had money to build a boat for the children from across the Incomati River to come across when the river was in flood. We had money to have some furniture made. It was altogether a very successful little building. Here, an extension to an hospital at Chikumban. Here is the old hospital. And this was built to replace the huts, which was how the hospital was when we started talking about it, very much like the Dr. Schweitzer's hospital in the Congo. This was the maternity we also built ourselves. We built an enormous amount of, of such buildings over a long period of years of collaboration. Here, uh, house and offices for the agricultural missionary looking after the <coughs> cooperative at Makuvalan on the other side of Antioch, on the banks of the Incomati River. This was an area with tremendous amount of insects and mosquitoes, and the courtyard was fly-screen. This chap had quite a number of children. We also built this house ourselves with the people from the mission. There it is from far away, and the whole of the land was made very useful and the people learned how to grow things very well. Here a view, you can see that it's very cheaply built, that it's just bag, block work, precast concrete elements on the roof with piles over it. <coughs> Here, Kovolar um, building built for the Swiss mission and for the Methodist church in 
Lorenzo Marx as an hostel for African students from the interior who had no place to stay at in, in Lorenzo Marx. This was a building that I was in quite a lot of trouble with, with the missionaries because this was going to be the boys' building and that was the girls' building. And I said, we must make the buildings different. One must be a boy building and one must be a girl building. And they disagreed with that and we, we had quite a dispute over it. But they didn't mind that I made the building into a mosque. That they accepted and they were quite thrilled. You can see that the building at both ends turns out to be an enormous mosque looking back at the city. Here the entrance to the boys' side from the street before the sidewalk was made and the sign I designed for them and the letters that the girls' side. Okay, Perry. Now, this goes on to a number of very simple, very economical schools. This one, a practical school at Chikumban for the Swiss mission, for the Presbyterian Church, to teach the people in the bush agriculture and how to grow things. The only part that we ever built was this part, the workshop. We could never raise the money for the rest. The workshop we built and we transformed the mezzanine in the workshop into a temporary boarding school which was still functioning uh, just before I left when the missionary that ran it was arrested and beaten up by the new police. Um, the Various elements are connected by water channels, which were used in a symbolic manner. The ground sloped down that way, and when it rained, the water from the roofs flowed into the fields outside, down, down at that end, which were the experimental fields of the school. The whole of the school was contained in a road mandala of trees, the idea of which was to keep out the traffic. These were the houses of the various teachers at the school. These were the dormitories. There was a central chapel which was sunk into the ground with very, very deep steps. And this is another school, this time for the Catholic sisters at Inyamban. Inyamban is an old Portuguese town, an old port about 400 kilometers north of Lorenzo Marx and these sisters wanted to have a building which was both the boys and girls high school downstairs and became the girls boarding school for the whole of that part of the interior of Mozambique. And this was the building that I designed for them. Um, they never got around to building it. Here are two more schools. One the railway school at Inyamban, the railway training college <clears throat> that I designed for a builder who got the contract on government sketch plans and then he knew that I was designing another school and he came around to ask me to design this school for him and here an axonometric of what it was with this tremendous campanile, the train, which I didn't once again manage to build. The hall of it is built except for this part which there was no money for and that was the auditorium. This one is the school at Villa Peri, the agricultural college at Villa Peri that I was asked to design by the public works department and this one is I saw it before I left all up. I don't know what <clears throat> has happened to it, but it's quite a development on this one. Some, some of the sheds on it are two or three stories high, even if they just single story buildings. This is a tremendous, yes, 
This is a tremendous uh, covered gymnastics place. These are the, this is the library, the administration, the classrooms, an auditorium, the youth club, the dining room, and the dormitories with this tremendous three-story volume that one goes to to get to the upstairs in these two staircases and the little sick room element stuck on the side. These are very, very simple block buildings costing as little money as possible. Here it is, an architecture of no frills at all, just sheds, corrugated asbestos, made as well as one could. There's the missing auditorium and the missing train. Now, this building had, I don't think one can see, oh, you can see it here, yes. Pity, can you focus that one? There. This is the sewerage plant, which all sticks out and is treated as a beautiful piece of machinery. And it was the first exposed sewerage plant that I ever put together, and I got very, very excited about that. Now, if you look in the background, you will see another building, which is another school I built. This, quite a different sort of a building, quite uh, a pompous building made to face the square. So it's arranged in quite a different way. Can you go on? <coughs> A few sites of the railway school, the various dormitory levels. The dormitories were very carefully, very economically designed inside, down to the blankets that I got a factory to <coughs> make for us. Blankets in stripes, black and orange. Here are some of the other sheds and looking into the kitchen and dining room area, okay? There's the train that must have been built and the postal college and new post office for Nyamban, the back elevation of this building, it was <clears throat> a full-fledged post office downstairs used for teaching with classrooms upstairs and offices upstairs. Next. There it is, where it looked out onto the square and what one saw symmetrically from the square. One little church, this time in Rhodesia at Namandovo, St. James the Great. Namandovo means the meat of the elephant. And this was at a little Anglican mission school for girls in Rhodesia, the only school that gave African girls a decent secondary education. And this was the church <coughs> which Father Bothright asked me to design, and here it is. A very simple building again, made, designed in such a way that you didn't have to cut any blocks. Everything was made in the proportion of the blocks and it had lots of alcoves and seats built into it and a very simple plain roof. We again built it just with a mission labor. I designed every single one of the different roof trusses. The building had no ceiling. We went up and spent some days with them putting the roof trusses together. Okay. Another church in near Lorenzo Marx at the mission at Mashava. This one in concrete using a factory sort of a roof with a shell roof contained by these beams which then start twisting and turning into crosses. Okay. <clears throat> the church as it was for about 10 days <laughs> and later, <laughs> next, and a view of the elements of the church and some of the school children from 
the school that the fathers of the, by the way, the name of the church is the Sagrada Familia Damashava. <laughs> Another little church and house for Pastor Lituri from the Congregational Church. Uh, a very simple shed with exposed corrugated asbestos underneath and exposed roof trusses and a little house for Pashtor Lituri with a courtyard in between, strangely using some of the elements as seats from the very sumptuous house in Johannesburg. There wasn't even enough money to plaster it. Okay. There the seats in use, all these recesses, all this sitting into the walls and the entrance to the church on the day it was inaugurated with all the festive ribboning. Thanks. A more recent church, this time a very English church because it was for the Anglican bishop in Lorenzo Marx. It was the Anglican center and it's a building. I talk the municipal planners and architects into letting me make this road and then I made the building so that it would turn on itself to make to make a square because it was in a very noisy a very a very noisy place with traffic on that street big buses and trucks on this street as well now this was the actual church auditorium this was a school it had shops underneath it had um, uh, a center, an Anglican center, a cloakroom, a little flat for the caretaker, the bishop's office, an apartment, and two houses. So and there was a warehouse underneath. So it was really a very, very complex building. It, um, as we were building it, it grew another floor because they needed more accommodation. There is the other floor. This was a later addition of a chapel. It was a very flexible building. It could take all these extensions and alterations without any disturbance. Here is a view of the back of the church with this enormous transparente over the altar, the entrance into the upper courtyard. One went up about five or six steps onto a raised courtyard. Next and a view of the courtyard in the late afternoon and of the church of San Cipriano, San Cipriano de Chamanculo and one lot of the paintings by Malangatana Guenya Valente which is the story of Saint Cyprian who was a saint in North Africa that was persecuted by the Romans and was in a lot of trouble and we thought he would be a very symbolic saint to write a story about. This was all painted still in Dr. Caetano's time, but it applies just as much today. Here is some of the light fittings inside the church and some of the very simple tubular furniture with hardwood planks that I designed for the church. A painting about scales and faces, and another painting also about quarter scale, one eighth scale, and one sixteenth scale, which I find very useful now that I'm in a teaching position. Next, Kevin. Some embroideries of aircraft, that one from a drawing I did of a drawing by Petty when he was four or five, uh, a clutter of aircraft flying away. Various jets. Another jet on the left and some Max Factor jets. <laughs> now, the reason 
for showing you those is that those particular aircraft were turning into buildings. They were turning into buildings which I've called the bubblies. Here is one in Lorenzo Marx where the bubbles are quite soft still. This was a building trying to get maximum use out of this site and the occupation of, of the roof space as, as offices. We were going to build it, but we won't build it now. This particular one was a building I designed for a little desert town in southern Angola at Port Alexandre. And it's a pair of twins, as you can see, and there's a straight twin, and there's a twisted twin. And they're the same, they're almost the same kind of building, but one is twisted and the other one is straight. And this one I almost got built. Next. Here he is, the last time I saw it, getting the first coat of ochre paint there on the round curved facade which faced onto the circular square and here <coughs> onto the straight street. It was a bank downstairs and um, an apartment upstairs and a shop downstairs and an apartment upstairs with its own entrance. These buildings were for uh, a banking firm that I was working for in Angola and designed just before the revolution about 20 buildings. Here's another one of these buildings, the one at Serpa Pinto, which had this double volume with these arches, which came over from another building that I'd already started building as well at Mosambadish. And here an axonometric of this building with the screened louvered balconies, because this faced west in this small town. And another two buildings, the lateral facade of the building at um, Prada Dasa, which was very much in the news some months ago, and the lateral facade of the bank, managers, residents, and staff rooms at Musende in Angola as well, right? <clears throat> and now we come to the very last of the stories. This is a story about three projects for the Venice Biennale last year. And this first project, I just want to find a story about it. This one, this first project is called a wall of glass faces, and it's um, a monument <clears throat> to be incorporated into the area of Venice that we were asked to look at last year for the Biennale. Now, what I wrote about this is that Venice is the place of reflections and mirrors of windows within windows. This wall of glass faces is a celebration of the flooded city. It is a public seat. It is a children's paddling pool, the name of a place, the square of glass faces. It is also a sun clock, a light fitting for a people's place. The faces are to be cast in rough wooden shuttering boxes lined on some planes with metal sheeting. The glass is to be ordinary glass, bottle glass, which should vary in tone slightly with each casting. Except for the little face in tears, the skull and the cut-up face, which will reveal themselves both ways, the back will be a blank wall of glass squares of various sizes. The wall must be placed so that the faces look north for the sunlight to strike them from behind and laterally. At night the wall will have its own light coming from the underground <coughs> service tunnel, which also houses the pool's water pump and filter. The sighting of the wall must be carefully considered so sunlight strikes it for as long and in as many ways as possible. In the damp and foggy winter, the artificial light must remain on all day and orange filters must be installed to hot up the light. Next. 
here is a maquette for the wall of glass faces in hardwood. The back elevation with the face in tears, the skull and the cut up face. Next. Now the second project is a project called 16 Weddings. 16 weddings consists of a set of 32 small figures to be cast in glass. They are 16 couples, 16 brides and 16 bridegrooms. I have brought with me 32 carved hardwood matrixes from which casting molds can be prepared. The glass must be quite ordinary bottle glass of different colors. The finish of most of the pieces is to be as cast and somewhat rough like peasant clay figures or wooden toys. Some couples may however be polished and burnished to indicate their higher status. <coughs> Considering their Catholic and Luso-Italian origins, only married couples recognized by their resemblance to each other will be sold. Private rearrangements, <laughs> private rearrangements and exchanges can only take place after the sale. Here is the couples as a breeze soleil, which they were going to be at one stage, and there a close up of the couples. And a drawing which is part of the submission and an elevation, flat on elevation of all these couples. Now, the last proposal was a proposal to build two monumental heads in, in concrete. And these two monumental heads of two representatives of the people in confrontation over each other's legitimacy, they really represented the essence of democracy. The idea that there is an opposition to the government, which is talking back at the government all the time and making things difficult for the government. You can see that the government is rather grey and uniform. This one still retains some colour it is already almost a consolidated opposition which has consolidated itself into a single party. That's why they're all somewhat brown. Exhibition of these monumental heads hovering above everybody and whoever came into the exhibition all had to come in underneath this archway. And here we have love and what appears to be violence. Thank you. Peter, there's no questions at all.
houses start off as amitable women that the clients are very kind about but they tell me it's not what they want and then it moves over onto something much more geometrical. The very elaborate house in Johannesburg was for a long long time a very soft kind of a house which had very many of the things that the very geometrical, very sharp-edged house got in the end. How close do you scrutinize yourself when you're doing the various projects? Because what seems very highly personal artistic sensibility and everything is allowed to have full range of one thing and it's very, very much held back from another thing. You find yourself <coughs> criticizing yourself on some projects greater, to a greater extent than you do on others. You mean some of the very blank cheap schools? The cheap schools, yes. It seems to be incredibly rational about how you put material together, about how you put a roof over a space. The other ones are just as rational. <laughs> but are they just as rational? Yes, they, <coughs> they've got roofs. <laughs> <laughs> These, um, these schools, which are very simple, and those are the very large schools, they schools that have to go out to tender to builders. And the builders will give a very simple price. It's almost like hypnotizing the builder into thinking he's got a very rational, very simple building to do. Because he sees these sheds and he says, ah, at last there's no architecture. And he can build, he thinks he can build this very quickly. But there's an awful lot of architecture because all those things move back and forth and they, as you move around those buildings, they sort of come sure, up I was from... I in terms of the, the sort of the first batch of buildings you showed us, which were very sort of spiky and very weird and sort of expressionistic, reorientated rather than rationally oriented. <coughs> I always wondered how you actually sort of came to making those decisions. Well, it is purely you just sort of get to put a pencil on a piece of paper and it doesn't sort of fall out. Or you do actually go through a very conscious design process. No, I, I, I don't think there is a very conscious design process. They, they buildings that, those particular buildings were part of a group of buildings, like I said, that I designed with a number of concerns, with a concern for <clears throat> around the idea of very shocking apparitions in the city, buildings which would be very disturbing in the city. So you consciously set out to do that? Well, no, I did them first and then rationalized about it. <laughs> okay, Peter, let's go. <laughs> Time, and I think he is.